All right, so what Craig had asked me was how to add another indicator to his system. Uh, it's essentially, it's kind of a, uh, what I call a permissive, right? So uh, as a very oversimplified example, you know, say like if you had the MACD, if, you, if you're into using the MACD, right, you might want to only take longs when the MACD is above the zero line. As a very simple um, requirement, you know, it's kind of a permissive, so no long trades can be taken unless the MACD is above the zero line. All right, so that's kind of like an absolute permissive. And that's uh, the same type of situation that Craig had asked me. Um, although Craig is using the ultimate oscillator here. So let me just add this on to my chart. Let's see, let me just thicken that line up. And we're gonna, I'll use this neutral line here as the value that we need to be above or below. And I'll make it red, so it's pretty easy to see. All right, so we have our ultimate oscillator down here, and actually I'll move it up to the, up to the top there. And let's see, actually, I'm gonna add a couple of moving averages, and I'll just make a, a very uh, simple moving average crossover system as our simple uh, main signals to go along with this ultimate uh, oscillator. So let's see, how about if I just do a 10 and 14 crossover. All right, I think that works pretty good. So what I'm gonna do is just build, build a simple crossover uh, system, and then we'll start filtering the trades out based on the ultimate oscillator being above the 50 line or below the 50 line. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right onto the logic board and start working on the logic board here. So, um, I'll give this a name, so this is going to be a cross crossover um, with the ultimate um, oscillator. And uh, yeah. all right. Okay, so I'll build. I'm going to build the crossover signal first. So the crossover, you know, this crossover sol solver will just kind of represent, you know, the core, the core uh, trade signals, you know, that your system um, is, that your system is. So, you know, you may have something far more complicated than this, but I um, just want to build something real quick. Alright, so we can see um, the crossover signals on the chart now. And next we'll add this ultimate oscillator as a permissive here. And so with the ultimate oscillator, <clears throat> since it, it's in its own um, uh, sub-panel, right, so this ultimate oscillator Essentially, it's kind of like a stochastic, uh, right? It ranges from 0 to 100, all right? So it is range-bound, um, and, you know, it's in its own panel. So typically, you know, an indicator like this, the ultimate oscillator, or an indicator such as the CCI, the stochastics, the MACD, right? They all run in their own sub-panel. Um, so indicators like those, when you're looking for your indicator to be above or below 
a fixed value, a certain value. So in this example, I'm going to use the red line here, which is 50, a value of 50. <clears throat> We're going to use the threshold solver for those uh, types of requirements. All right, so for this type of permissive, we need to have the oscillator above 50 in order to take a long signal or below 50 in order to take a short signal. <clears throat> um, so, let's see. Um, so what I'm going to do is set all these all of these up to 50. And so for a long a long output, I want a long output when we're at 50 or greater. So I'll put a 1 in this in this box. And then down below for the short outputs, um, I want a short when the oscillator is at 50 or less. So I'll put a 1 there. And then next I need to change my indicator here. So I'll switch that over to the ultimate oscillator. And I'm just using the the deep the default periods here. Alright, click that in. Okay, so now as we um, look at the chart here. Alright, so it's pretty apparent that when the indicator's below the red 50 line, we're getting a short. So it's kind of a basically this this solver now is it's giving us a permissive to take a short right when the indicator is below 50 and then it's giving us the permission uh, to take a long when the indicator is above 50 such as over here and let me name this Alright, so that's our ultimate oscillator, and I'll just put 50 in there, because we're looking for it to be above or below 50. And this crossover is a 1014, so I'll just give that a name. Alright, so the next thing we need to do is join those two solvers together with an AND node. So the AND node is saying that both solvers have to be in agreement before an output can go through the AND node. Um, so let's see, let's, let's take a look at the crossover without permissives. And I'll just mark a couple of these. So for those of you who are, are new to Bloodhound, this toolbar is really handy when you're building your system. So as you can see, what it does is it allows me to mark up, mark conditions on the chart that I can re refer back to later on. So now I'm going to come back over here and connect the AND node up look at my chart and I can see which signals disappeared on me. So I can see this long signal here disappeared on me and that's because our indicator is below the 50 line. So that created the permissive there and it filtered out this long signal. So pretty simple. Um, and let's um, it's going to cover a, another way um, a very similar kind of condition, but let's just say, let's just say, um, we want the ultimate oscillator. We only want to take a trade when the ultimate oscillator is above the 50 line. So if, if the oscillator is below the 50, we don't want to take any trades. But if it's above the 50, then that's what that's the only time we want to take trades. So I'll build another 
threshold solver to look at that type of situation. So let me connect this up. And I'll give this a name. Once again, we'll switch over the indicator here. And we're just looking to make sure the indicator is above 50. So all I need is just 50 in the A threshold. And so we want to be able to take a long trade when it's at 50 or above. So I'll put a 1 here. And we also want to be able to take a short trade when it's at 50 or above. So I'll put a 1 there. So if we look at the solver's output here, you'll see that Bloodhound is giving us you know, a fuzzy logic type of output. right? So we can see that um, when the indicator exceeds 50, Bloodhound's output is 1. And as the indicator comes down and approaches 0, we can see the output of that solver is um, reducing. It's getting lower and lower. Let me kind of scroll through here a little bit. <clears throat> see if that... There we go. So this... The oscillator got down to 20. We can see right the solver's output is approaching zero as the indicator approaches zero. Um, you know, so that's kind of that like that's how you would use the fuzzy the fuzzy logic part of Bloodhound. But if we just want a nice clean, you know, permissive signal. What I can do is I can put 50 in here again. And now, right, if you look at the chart, um, the solver's output now is just either, it's either, you know, on or, or off, so to speak. Right, so the indicator has to be above 50 uh, in order to get an output. Anytime it dips below, there's no output. Right, and, and that's because... Um, Bloodhound is is always interpret interpolating. It's creating a ratio between A and B, and it's creating a ratio between the values of B and C. So, in this case, let me let me put B back to zero, and we have the fuzzy logic output. So, Bloodhound is creating a ratio between A and B, or between 50 and zero, right? So we can see when the indicator is changing from 50 and approaching zero right we can see that there's this the output is matching that ratio right so from 50 to zero the output is going from one to zero on the output right so you can see that there there can be a ratio between 50 and zero and then the output is following that ratio from a value of 1 to a value of 0. So on the output side here, we can see that over here, Bloodhound's output is 1. And then the output drops down in the same ratio amount as the indicator does when it starts to approach 0. So that's how the fuzzy logic um, portion of Bloodhound works. So now if I put a 50 in B, now there is no ratio. So right, A in, A is 50, B is 50, so there's, there's no um, distance between those. And so if we read our outputs now, we can see that when we're at 50, the output is zero. When we're at, when the indicator is at zero, so when the ultimate oscillator is at zero, the output is zero. 
when the ultimate oscillator is at 50, the output is zero. But then when the ultimate oscillator gets to 50 or greater, then we have an output of one. So that's kind of how we eliminate the fuzzy logic part. And, all right, so if I want to use this type of logic here, let me go back to where I marked up my chart. There we go. Let me mark a few more of these signals here. I'll mark this one. And one more here. All right, so I will disconnect that previous threshold solver and reconnect this new one, and we'll see how the signals change there. All right, so looking at the chart, um, you know, the ultimate oscillator really isn't, wasn't designed, you know, to be long or short above the 50. So we can see that uh, essentially it, it uh, killed or blocked all of the short signals that we used to have. All right, so pretty much if you're looking for the ultimate oscillator to be above 50, all that you're left with primarily are just the long signals. And that's because the ultimate oscillator was not designed to go long, to go short above the 50. So, uh, so this is really kind of the the wrong indicator, you know, to be looking for it to be above 50 for longs and shorts. But just wanted to give you that that demonstration there. All right. Um, so let's see. All right, Craig. I hope that answers it. Um, and so Craig is asking, so what are C, D, and E used for? Um, well, it, it, they're used if you have more threshold values. So, you know, it, it, if you're like, um, for example, all right, let me just add another threshold solver on here. <clears throat> and... Let me switch this over to the CCI. So, the CCI. So if you're using the CCI, you know, some people like to look at different levels. Um, you know, so you might want to look at like 200, then you might want to look at 100, and then zero, and then negative. Let's see, oops. I need to clear that zero out, so negative 100. Or, uh, oops, let me clear that zero out, negative 200, right? So the reason why there's five thresholds in here is so that you can get two above zero or two below zero, you know, whatever your case may be. Um, or something like um, the stochastics. Uh, you know, if I was using the stochastics, I could look, you know, make sure the stochastic is above 80. Um, once again, if I wanted to create like a digital outlook, I could put 80 in there twice. And if I wanted to make sure the stochastic was below 20 before I took a short, right, I could put 20 in there. And so if I was looking at the stochastic, let me uh, switch this over to the stochastic. And let me put some outputs in here so we actually see something. So I can, I know now I don't have to have the stochastics on my chart, but I know that when I get a long output here, I know the stochastics is, is at 80 or greater for the long side. And if I scroll through here, let's see.
Oh, sorry, I made a classic mistake here. Um, so my classic mistake is I left C at zero. You always have to keep these thresholds in descending order here. Um, so basically, because I had a zero and 20 is greater than zero, so essentially these these thresholds, you know, the way that the logic is written, you know, these thresholds kind of get ignored because 20 is greater than 50. So what I need to do is set C to 50 so that it, it's in between 80 and 20. So now you can see all my values are in descending order, like so. And now, there we go. There's some short outputs there. So I, I, I know that just when I, when I see Bloodhound, you know, painting the chart red, I know that the stochastic is at 20 or less. So that's why there's five threshold values in there, Craig. Uh, yeah, so good, good question there. And how about if I pop this back to the CCI real quick? So similarly, um, I wanted to know if the CCI was above 100 or below negative 100. I could do something like this. Um, right? So without having to have the CCI on my chart, I can tell when the CCI is above 100 when I see the green racing stripes or below negative 100 when I see the the red. Um, and if I wanted to create a fuzzy logic type of output, I could set B and D to zero. And I need to expand this, but right, I can see the output here, you know, uh, this analog type of an outlook here. And so that's so if I look here, I can see that, uh, let's see, Bloodhound is about at 0.7. So the CCI is approximately 70 on its value there. Because, once again, 0.7, if I look at my thresholds, I'm, Bloodhound is interpolating, is creating a ratio from 0 to 100. All right, so that's a pretty simple uh, ratio to calculate so that I know that if, if Bloodhound here, right here, I know that if Bloodhound is at 70, then the CCI is a proc, I mean, if Bloodhound is at 0.7, then I know the CCI is at, a, at basically is at 70. So. And um, also, keep in mind, um, you can also go to the documentation there are examples on the documentation pages. So, right, so I'm on the documentation page, and if I look on the, the menu bar on the right-hand side here, if I scroll down to Bloodhound Reference, and then I can see right here all the confidence solvers, there's a list of all of them. So if I take a look at the threshold, and so right here at the bottom, it's right, so under contents in the bottom of the page, there's examples. Um, if I, I'm going to scroll up just a little bit. So there's, there's a, uh, a tutorial video right here as well that covers the solver. But there's also some examples here, right? So, so let's see. There's one A, one B. So there's two examples. So three examples. Yeah, so there's three different types of examples there. So Bob wants to see a couple of exit logic examples. So I'm going to see if someone has any kind of specific exit logics they'd like to see. Otherwise, I'll use Bob's, Bob's suggestion of just using a moving average. All right, let's see. Bob is saying uh, the Keltner bands could be another exit example. All right, well, yeah, I kind of finished scanning through here, and I don't see any other suggestions for an exit logic, so I'll just use um, 
Bob suggestions of a moving average and a Keltner. All right. Um, let's shrink this up. Let's see. All right. I already have some moving averages on my chart. That's good. And how about if I throw Keltner on here? Oh, would I like to save my template? Yes, I should save my template here. So let's use today's date. All right. All right, so let's see. Yeah, today's the 18th. All right, so there. Okay, so I named my logic template. I'll add, I'm going to add another SMA and uh, make it a much bigger period. So it makes a little more sense. Uh, I don't know how, 55 maybe. Okay. Alright, so I already have this crossover solver and I'll use that to kind of generate the signals. And um, let me leave that intact. All right, so let's see, I'll make a new new logic here for some signals. Um, all right. So in Raven, I'll just use this crossover solver as a simple entry. And now I'll create another, a third logic template. And this will be um, my exits. All right. Um, Let's see, so for the moving average, um, so let's see, I'll, I'll start with a simple one first. So I'm going to take the red moving average and we'll turn that into an exit. So if price, you know, crosses the moving average, that'll be our exit logic. That'll be our indication to, to jump ship. All right, so we'll just use a, all, it, all it's going to require is just a, a simple crossover solver and we're looking for the closing price so I'm going to take a little shortcut here I'll just use the closing price in indicator A section and then down here in indicator B I need to switch this SMA over to a 55 period Essentially, that's it. Um, let me expand my chart out a little bit. So let's take this as an example. If, right, let's say if we were uh, fortunate enough to get long right in here in this nice trend, then if when price comes down and it crosses the, the 55, right here right you can see we have a short output and so the short output would exit our long trade right here would exit our long position alright so that's one simple example and let's go ahead and let's see let me close this up and I'll throw a raven on here and we'll just take a look at this. All right. Add Raven down the bottom. And when you're working in Raven, always start up at the top and work your way down. So let's load up today's today's Bloodhound file. So there it is, April 18th. All right, and 
um, you know, as a good practice, I always like to take a look at my logic just to make sure the leaders uh, are in, you know, are, look correct. So I'm going to use this entry crossover SMA 1014. All right, so that looks correct. And check my exit template, and that looks correct. All right, so everything looks correct. Now, here's a little tip. Whichever um, logic template you leave this on, that's the one that gets displayed on the chart from Raven. Right? You know how Raven shows you the Bloodhound's output. So whichever logic template I leave, um, you know, I leave when I close the interface, that's the logic template that shows up on the chart. And typically, you know, most people like to see their entry signals um, being displayed from Raven. So I'll switch this back over to the entry logic and then click OK. And I will go ahead and just lock this, lock my entry logic in and my exit logic. I will need to set that, so I'll put that on my exit logic there. Uh, limit orders, now we'll just, this is just for quick demonstration, so I'll leave that alone, uh, all right. So remember uh, to set back test mode to true. Um, I'm having Jeremy change that default, so it's going to now default to true. So you don't have to remember this. And let's see, all right. I'll just, let's see. How about if I, I'll leave, um, yeah, I'll leave the profit target and stop loss blank. So that way we're using our exit logic. So Raven will either exit the trade using our, our exit logic up here, or Raven will reverse the trade if we get a reversal signal coming in. All right, turn it on. Last step is to always make sure you turn it on. Let's take a look what do we got. All right, you'll notice that it looks like there's two bloodhounds on the chart. So remember the top one here is bloodhound as an indicator. The bottom one is bloodhound that's coming from Raven, right? So Raven is calling this bloodhound on the bottom. So you can see, so the one on the bottom is the one that's showing our, our entry signals. And, right, so the one on the bottom is our entry signals. And I can tell because if you look at the buttons up, up, up on top of the chart, right, you'll see there's a button, a button here with black text and a button with orange text. So this orange text lets you know that this is Raven, right? So Raven, uh, th this Bloodhound button is being called by Raven. And I can see that Raven is set to display my entry signal. So I can see that down here at the bottom, these are my entry signals. Um, and then Bloodhound right here Right, I have it set to show me my exit examples. So I can see that. Um, let me draw a line here. So if we look at our entry signals down here at the bottom, right, I can see this long signal here. So let me just draw a line there, kind of marking that long entry. And how about if I make it a green or um, all right, how about blue instead? So I'll expand this out. All right. 
right, so we have this long entry signal, and so we can see that um, NinjaTrader put us long here at the open of the bar, so right up in here, um, and then when price came down and it crossed below, right, our red SMA line, it closed our long position. So we can see right here, looking at the text, it closed our long. So it price came down, met our exit logic examples, and closed out the trade. So if, let's see, how about if we, um, if we take a look right here. So if we look at the bottom, we can see here that we have a short, um, short, short entry, the short signal, right, which occurred on this bar. <clears throat> and so Ninja put a short at the opening of the next bar. So we're short here. And then we can see we have this long signal. So on the next bar here, Raven automatically re reversed our position and put us long. So if we look at the text, we can see that um, right here it closed the short position. So it closed this sh short position, closed it, and then it took a long position. All right, so that's kind of a simple moving average exit logic. And let's um, see if I can make something up for the Keltner channel. <clears throat> so I'm just kind of thinking to myself what I want to use for the Keltner channel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think this band is a little too narrow. So let's see if I double that, double the bandwidth. Let's see. Well, how about this? Instead of using the band, I'll just use the midline of the Keltner, which essentially is a moving average. Um, so there's no point in doing that. Um, <laughs> All right. I'll just put this multiplier back to its default settings, and I'll use that. Um, All right, so I'm going to use Bloodhound to build this new exit logic. Right, you can you can work within Raven if you want. I don't suggest it. Um, you know, who knows what kind of weird things might go on if you do such a thing. Um, so. You know, you, you may or may not get updates in real time. You know, if I switch that over. Um, yeah, so here's kind of one of the drawbacks. So th this Bloodhound interface is being is being called by Raven. So this is Bloodhound working inside of Raven, right? So you can see when I changed my leaders, nothing changed on the chart, right? Bloodhound did not change its output on the chart. So that's kind of one reason why you don't want to work within Raven. So let me just close that out. And let me use the black button here. So the, the black text button is Bloodhound as an indicator. And so now, if I drop a solver in here, connect it up right so you can see my chart is updating in real time here so that's kind of the main reason why you want to work within bloodhound as an indicator so all right let's see the keltner channel um so to kind of define some rules 
How about when price right crosses above uh, above our mid band, or I'm sorry, above the upper band, we'll exit long positions, and when price crosses below the lower band, we'll um, exit short trades. All right, so in other words, we want to design our solver to give us a short signal when price crosses above the upper band. All right, so remember the short output will exit a long trade. And if we're short, if we have a short position on, we want a long output from Bloodhound to exit this short trade that's on. And once again, we'll use the crossover solver again. Um, well, I, I, let's see. Mm, yeah, let's see. I could use the crossover solver, but you know what? Probably what's a safer bet is if I use the comparison solver. So I'll use the comparison solver first. So for the comparison solver here, indicator A is going to be it's going to be our price. Indicator A will represent uh, the closing price, or actually, I think what would be hmm, kind of deciding if maybe I should use the high of the bar or the low of the bar. Um, yeah, maybe I should just use the closing price because that way we don't get closed out too soon. Um, but then again, I guess if you're really using the bands to to determine, you know, to take your profits, you would want to use the high of the bar or the low of the bar. So yeah, so I'll I'll use the the high of the bar. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to use the high of the bar to determine when, right, when the high of the bar crosses the upper band, that will trigger an exit signal. And when the low of the bar crosses below the band, then that'll trigger an exit on our short positions. Just trying to see if I can find any examples here. Yeah, this might be a good example right here. All right, so we get the high of the bar here, but the close, right, was inside the band. Now, right here, it's really hard to tell the closing price may not have exceeded the band to actually trigger an exit. So for backtesting this, we may actually miss this as an exit logic if the closing price here didn't cross above. So for backtesting reasons, it would be better to use the high of the bar to make sure that we got Right, that, to make sure that we got an exit signal, at least for historical backtesting reasons. Um, uh, yeah, so that we'll see what happens there. So if I'm going to use the high of the bar and the low of the bar to uh, to determine right as my prices to determine my exits then for indicator A, instead of using, right, so instead of using the closing price, I will use chameleon to
to get the high and the low of the bar. So I'll scroll down here to SI and we'll use chameleon. So for the high of the bar, uh, we want a short signal from the high of the bar and from the low of the bar we want a long signal. All right, so once again, as we look at this, if we're in a long trade, we want to use the high of the bar to generate a short signal to exit a long trade. So if for some reason we're long right here, we want a short signal from this high price to exit our long trade. And, yeah, so we can... Uh, let's see, actually, yeah, it's comparing right now what we're seeing on the chart is we're seeing the high and low of the bar either above or below the SMA 14. So that's kind of what we're seeing right now. So let's switch this over to our Keltner. And we're going to use the upper band and the lower band. So the upper band, we want a short signal. And from the lower band, we're going to use that to generate a long signal. All right, I'm just looking at my outputs here, making sure everything looks correct. All right, 10 period. I'm just, right, what I'm doing is I'm checking my indicator settings. So, right, I've got 1.5 and 10 for the Keltner channel. And I'm just going to double check my settings in here. And, yes, 1.5 and 10. That looks good. And, oh, okay. So, I'm just noticing things aren't quite looking right and so all I need to do now is to change my outputs, change the way the outputs are working. So there we go. So I had to, in a sense, reverse my output. So if we look at, at how, right, if we look at the description of this output here, Right, so we want we want a short signal, we want a short output when the high high when the high is greater than the upper band. So if we look at this, so for the short outputs when A, A is our high price, is greater than B, which is the upper band, that's when we want a short output. And then over here when the low is less than the lower band, that's when we want a long signal. And so as we read this, A is the low. So when the low is less than the lower band, we want an output. We want a long output. So there we go. So that's all we're working correctly now. And so essentially, right, whenever price is outside of our band, we're going to get, you know, uh, we're going to get an exit signal. So this is kind of a, a safer way to generate an exit signal, right, whenever price is outside of our band. You'll see that, right, so we're getting multiple exit signals. It's kind of a safer way. Uh, we could... I could just build a quick crossover solver that would just give us one signal. So let me just build this real quick just to show you. Now, yeah, 
yeah, so here's kind of another thing using the crossover is my logic is going to be a little backwards. And you'll, I'll show you what I mean in here in just a moment. Right, so we can see now, right, whenever the high crosses the upper band, right, we get an output. And, right, the output's the wrong direction, right? We're getting a long output, right? And that's because the high price is crossing above our band, right? So this is a cross above situation. So that's why we're getting a long out. Um, and the same for right here, right? When the low crosses below the lower band, of course, price is crossing below the band, so therefore we're getting a short output. And so as far as having to, you know, as far as having to select, you know, which long and short column, you know, I had to set this up opposite, right? So I had to set my crossover solver up opposite of the comparison solver just because of, because of the fact that I'm using a crossover uh, condition. So I had to make sure I got a signal in the right crossing direction. So that's why my long and shorts are opposite of what I had on my comparison solver. And what I can do is I can use a long short modifier. Well, actually no, let me so that I'll just use the invert invert solver here. Connect that in. And the invert can also reverse. So I actually don't want to invert. Right? If we look at my output, see, right, that's a true invert. Um, so I want to turn the invert off. And I just want to use the swap function here. So I will swap these. So there, so now with swapping them, so now when once price crosses our upper band, it gives us a short, right, our short output that's needed to exit a long trade. So if we compare these two, right, so the comparison solver gives us you know several several bars of an exit signal which you know in, in general sense that's a little safer you know technically it shouldn't be needed but you know I always like to build in a little safety factor uh, when building stuff and you know versus just using a crossover solver which just gives you one signal on the actual crossover situation All right so the choice is yours um, I'll go with uh, using the comparison solver here. Uh, so I just built right another set of logic, a different set of exit logic. Um, and how about if I just I'll copy this and rename it to my Keltner exit. delete that crossover solver I should name this right and yes yeah, so I'll leave my I'll leave this logic template here the exit examples I'll just yeah leave everything in here and so this exit Keltner will only consist of the Keltner band exit logic alright so I'm going to close this out right so when I close the interface that saves it back to the file so now that I've modified right my Bloodhound file my Bloodhound template I now need to go in and reload that file into Raven 
So right, so I'll use the orange button here to open up Bloodhound inside of Raven. And I need to go to File and load up this template here. And I can see these two new solvers popped in here. So I can close that out now. And I will need to um, have to press F5 to update the chart. Because I loaded a new Bloodhound file, I have to press F5 to update the chart. But what I really have to do is if I want to use that new exit logic, I actually have to open up my strategy, right? So I need to go into Raven. I need to go into Raven. I will have to turn it off, turn the strategy off. And that will allow me to change my exit logic. So now I can go in here and use the exit Keltner instead. And then turn it back on. And you know what? While we have Raven turned off, I think it's a good idea that we just take a look at our Bloodhound template. Just make sure everything looks correct. And yep, there we go. So that looks correct. So I'll click OK. All right, this is turned on, so I'll click OK. And so when I click OK inside the strategy window, basically that forced a refresh of the chart. All right. Um, so if we look at if we look at Bloodhound on our chart, right, you can see that both of them are showing our new Keltner exit logic here. So all what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Raven, so we can see Raven over here. Uh, I'm going to take Raven and have it show me uh, my entry signals here. check something make sure I didn't mix something up all right so entries yep that looks good and I'm just going to refresh the chart here there we go okay so I just had to refresh the chart all right, so now, right, the bottom bloodhound, which is Raven, is showing me my entry signals. And then bloodhound up here on top is showing me my exit signals. So, if we take a close look at one of these trades, so we can see where we got our exit signal right there. Right, there's our exit signal at the bottom of the chart. And um, price came down, broke the, the band, broke below the band, and Raven exited the trade. Let's see, so yeah, Bob's got a good question here. Can you specify the number of contracts when using an exit signal in Raven, no. Um, Raven will just exit the whole trade. So however many contracts you went into, Raven will close out the whole position. So it's an exit logic. So it's designed to close out your trade and essentially put you flat. So that's what the exit logic is designed for, is to close out your whole position. So the, kind of, so the exit logic was, let me disable this. All right, so this exit logic was really kind of designed 
so that you could build so that you could look for right indicator conditions that tells you that you know what your trend is over so you just need to, to completely get out so the exit logic was not designed to leg you out um, you know, it was not designed as um, a contract management you know or money management it was designed so that you could um, say so that you could look or build kind of trend trend looking conditions and you know if if you have indicators that you use to tell you that the trend might be ending, then you can build, you know, those set of rules, those set of conditions into an exit logic. And that's really kind of the core reason what this exit logic is for, is so that, you know, you can say, you know what, it looks like my trend is, is, is over. I need to completely close out and, you know, wait for my next trade setup before I enter the trade again. You know, so if you have a, you know, so if if you have a set of rules that kind of looks for when price is consolidating, you know, if, if you don't like trading and during consolidation, then you could build yourself a, a set of logic and exit the trade, you know, when you've determined that price is consolidating. So that's what that exit logic is for. Yeah, so what, how, however many contracts you have open, Raven will close them all out. So, so it, the exit logic is kind of like an, having an, an absolute stop loss, right? An absolute stop loss is there to kind of protect your maximum loss per trade. And the exit logic is kind of there to protect you uh, for when you think for when you know your rules are saying that you know what the trend is over I just need to jump out now and wait for the next uh, trade setup to come along so you know if you want to leg in and leg out that's what ATMs are used for so really that's that's why we built ATMs in into this so you can let your ATM manage you know your legging your legging out so. Okay. All right. So Don wants to exit if price closes below the high of a triple moving average. So you want to exit if price closes below the high of a TM, TMA1 nested into a TMA5 of the bar high. All right. So let me let me put this on the chart here. All right, so let me add the TMA on the chart. So there we go, the TMA. And let's see, so you, let's see. So Don, let me know if I've got this wrong. But I believe you want to, um, let's see. So we're going to use the bar high of a TMA 1 and then nested, let's see, a TMA 5. So Don, I think you want to take a TMA 1 period and nest it into a TMA 5 period. Does that sound correct? So let's take a, a TMA 1 and we'll nest a TMA 5 in here. And let's see. And we want the bar high in yeah, we want to use the the high price for the TMA five, I believe. 
So we'll use the high price. Alright Don, so hopefully I got this right. Um, so let's take a look at how we set this TMA up. Alright, so we have this TMA1 period and we have nested into it a TMA5 period using the bar high. And let's see, so let me let me take a look. So Don is using two sets of TMAs. So let me add another TMA onto the chart here. Okay. So this TMA, where we have the high of the bar nested into it, that's going to be used to exit uh, a long position. And so Don is also using a second TMA. So we'll build a second TMA, a one period, and we'll nest a five period TMA into here. And this time we're going to use the low price. There we go. So let me kind of adjust this. So right there, I believe that would be our exit right for this um, this short trade right here. So if we were if we were in a short trade right here, when when the closing price crosses above. Um, this TMA that uses the low price that would be that would exit our short trades and let's see and over here I think is where we would exit a long trade and alright so Don wants to use the SI Pro Ranko alright I guess the system works a little better with the with the Aranko bar. And let's see, I'll build a 7-2 bar here. So I'm just kind of looking at this, just trying to see how this would work out. All right, so I think um, clearly that would generate an exit signal for that long run. And 
this would generate an exit signal for this short run. Um, Yeah, you know, let's see. You know, realistically, Don, it looks like just whenever the bars reverse, you're always going to get an exit signal. So it looks like it'd be easier just to build a signal that just looks at the bar reversing to exit your trades. Uh, I don't know, maybe this bar is too big for the TMA periods. So maybe it works better if I use like a 4-1. Let me knock this down to a 4-1. Well, I don't know. kind of looks like the same situation that essentially whenever the bar reverses, it's just going to exit you. But um, here, I'll, I'll build the system uh, anyways. So let me shrink this up. So let me create a new logic template and all right, so exit, uh, yeah, I'll just call it the exit TMA and oh, let's see, I guess I'll use the crossover solver to do this. Alright, so I'm going to be looking for the closing price of the bar to cross the TMA. So I'll switch that over to the closing price. And so now the next thing is we need to build all this nesting of the TMA. Alright. So let's go, let's go add our first TMA. And then next, we're going to nest the TMA, right, into the TMA. And then next, we need to go get the low price or the high price. So we're going to use chameleon here. And I need to, yeah, so before I can nest another indicator into here, I need to, you know, select my indicator at the bottom here. So I need to select the one the indicator I want to get, I want to nest into. Um, so let's let's see. So I'm going to grab chameleon and then nest that into the TMA. All right. So from chameleon, I can use. Oh, actually, this first one is going to be the high. And uh, let's see. wondering if if I can do this in one set of solvers I believe I can so I'm gonna use right so I'm gonna nest I'm gonna nest the high price into the TMA right into the TMA to generate a short signal so remember, keep, keep in mind what I'm, I'm using a crossover solver. So as I think about this, when I look at right when I look at my chart, when the closing price crosses down below my TMA here, right? I'm the closing price is crossing down below. It's crossing down, so that's going to generate right a short output from the crossover solver. So, um, yeah. so I need to select the short column with the high. And um, for the low, so when, when the closing price crosses above our TMA that's using the low price, 
So when price crosses above, that's going to generate a long signal. So for the low price, I need to use the long column. Hmm. And not quite what I expected. Let's see. Oh, that's because I went a little too fast. So I need to go in here and adjust my periods. So uh, the first iteration of the TMA is a one period. The second one is a five period. All right, so now there we go. So essentially, you know what what I'm look what I'm seeing is it just looks like um, you know the closing whenever the Renko bar reverses, you know you can see that that's when um, that's when we're getting these that's when we're getting our exit signals is essentially whenever the Renko bar reverses. So. At least looking historically. Um, you know, in, in real time, things might be acting different. However, keep in mind that in real time, let me expand on this bar here. So like you see this bar with the, with this wick, this bar right here with the wick. Um, you know, even though price came way down. Raven would not exit you just because price crossed this right your TMA uh, because price came back up before the bar closed so the bar closed above the TMA so Raven would not actually exit you there so I'm not sure if that is kind of what you're looking for Don you know if you're looking for price crossing your TMA line in real time in which case that requires setting Raven up a little differently um, so, um, all right, Don, so essentially that's it. Um, you know, it just took a lot of nesting inside of our crossover solver, all right? So I had to grab a TMA, one period, nest the five period into it, and then nest my high and low prices into it. So let's see, Frank here. Uh, Frank's got a question. Any way to copy paste solver logic from one template? Uh, no, Frank, no. I'm pretty sure you've asked this question and other people have asked this question. No, there's no copy and paste yet. I know that, yeah, that copy and pasting function will just make things even a little quicker, you know. What I would suggest you could do for now, Frank, is what you can do for now is let me close this out and you could simply oops let me go into my indicator list you could just simply add you know another bloodhound um, another bloodhound on your chart and so I'm loading up the same file twice just keep in mind this can get really tricky, right? So I, so you can see I have Bloodhound on here twice. I have two buttons on here with black text, uh, and it, and it's the same file. So I can keep one interface over here, open up the other Bloodhound interface, keep it over here, and um, actually, you know what? This would be, yeah, this would be a safer thing to do. Instead of opening the file up twice, how about, I should give, I should rename this. So, just make this like a temporary one so that way I don't have the same file open twice 
and oop, come on. And so what I can do is I can have both of my files open side by side, and then I can set, you know, I can open up in the temporary one. I can open up, you know, the the logic template that has the solvers that you know I want to basically recreate in a new logic template right so what I can do is I can just look at this logic template look at it and then I could just go in here find the solvers right so let's see that solver name drop it in here and essentially just you know have this as a visual have this one you right as a visual reference and just kind of rebuild the logic uh, right and that should be pretty quick uh, to do that um, so you know that's I guess kind of the next best thing until we get all this you know uh, copy and paste and editing functionality built in so all right let's close that out All right, so Frank has got another question here. Uh, is there a way to measure distance between two indicators? For example, two moving averages or trigger lines uh, in regression lines. Let's see, trigger lines, let's see, linear regression lines. Let's see, I'd like to see when lines are spreading or coming closer or maybe I could compare the two slopes um, so Frank is are you really just wanting to measure the distance or are you looking for um, for example let me you know like for example a Bollinger band or this Keltner band you know are you are you looking for something like a, a Keltner band or Bollinger band to be contracting or expanding is that really what you're looking for uh, okay yeah so Frank um, I did find a way to do this right now um, it was probably a couple months back um, I had been asked to do this and I actually did discover a way um, to do it in the workshop I actually didn't think there would be a way, but I did find a way to do it in the workshop. And the way what what I found was I found an indicator had an indicator. Um, trying to remember what the name of the indicator was. It was an indicator that was measuring acceleration, I believe. So it was like the slope of the slope. So I'm going to take a quick look in here and see if I can remember what the name was. Or does anybody else out there remember what the name of that in indicator was that's measuring the slope of the slope or acceleration? Uh, I think there was another name. It was under another name. rate of change there it is ROC the rock yeah so rate of change um, so that's acceleration uh, yeah so I was able to use that uh, so let's see let me do this so rate of change and I think we had to use a two period um, so I'm just going to show you just what I used actually let's see yeah considering the time um, I don't really want to rebuild it but Frank, if you send me an email, I'll find the video for you on you that's up on YouTube, and you can watch that video. Uh, but just to kind of give you an idea, let me do the rate of change for one of these Keltner bands here. So let's change my input to the Keltner. Um, all right, yeah, the Keltner channel. And how about if I use the 
lower band. I'll pick on the lower band here. And, oops. Let's make this easy to see. Make this lavender three. Oh, shoot, darn. Let me see. Also, I want to make this lower band a little easier to see. So essentially what I was comparing, Frank, I, I was looking for a crossover, right? So this, this rate of change is looking at the rate of change for the lower band here, right? The thicker band. So I was comparing the rate of change of the lower band to the rate of change of the upper band. And I noticed that when these rate of changes crossed each other, that told me that the bands were either... Um, um, expanding away from each other or contracting towards each other so um, you know so that's kind of how I did that as I looked for uh, a crossover of two rate of two rate of change indicators so one being on the upper band and one being on the lower band right so Frank just yeah send me an email um, and then you know you can watch that watch that video so Looks like one last question from Frank in Raven. Can I use an ATM and an exit strategy at the same time? Yes. Yeah, so that was kind of what my comment was to Bob. Um, was that, yeah, it, the exit logic in Raven will, you know, close out any any position that Raven put on. The exit logic will will close it out. Right, so it doesn't matter if you're using an ATM or if you're using the default settings here. Raven will close both of those out. So, all right. Well, with that, guys, have a good Easter and uh, don't eat too many peeps.